I'm president of four different football clubs in four different countries and three different continents. And there's very few situations that have popped up where I've, where I haven't said to myself, oh, I've seen this before. Right. I saw this, you know, when Springer was coming up, or I saw this when Correa was coming up, or I mm -hmm. dealt with this issue with, you know, uh, Jared Cozart in our clubhouse. Like, Cause they're human beings playing professional sports right. and the issues they deal with and the egos and the, the conflict between teammates and between teams and everything, it, they're very, very similar as is some of the ways you have to uh, make these players better. You know, the Astros had a way of um, making sure that every player from big leagues to Dominican Republic Academy knew what their three most important player development goals were. We've instituted that now with my teams in football. You can grab any one of our players off the field and say, what are the three things you're working on? And they're gonna tell you. So those things work. The things that work in baseball also work in football. You just heard Jeff Lunau discuss the unlikely similarities between baseball and international football. He's now having success in football after winning three World Series championships in baseball. Today we'll discuss his scouting and player development blueprint and the Astros cheating scandal that led to his firing. Champions aren't born, they're built. This is Deconstructing Champions, a podcast that explores the art and science of winning to help you elevate your game in sports, business, and life. And now, your host, four-time World Series champion and founder of Four Rings Sports Solutions, Zach Scott. Hey everyone, and welcome to the show. Jeff Lunau took an unusual path to leadership in baseball. He was an engineer, entrepreneur, marketing VP, and consultant at one of the big three firms before getting hired by the owner of the St. Louis Cardinals. Right from the start, he was a disruptor, tasked with modernizing scouting and player development for a traditional regime that didn't necessarily want to hire the outsider. But his success was undeniable as their drafts were the most productive in the game. When he became the Astros GM, he transformed the organization through player development innovations. But there were multiple controversies, from illegal computer hacking to brash sign-stealing schemes, ultimately leading to his firing and suspension by Major League Baseball. At a career crossroads, he set his sights on international football, where he's applying his proven approach, and so far, the returns have been outstanding. Today, we'll discuss these topics, the importance of team leadership connecting with the fans, and more with the current CEO of Blue Crow Sports Group, Jeff Lunau. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me on, Zach. Now, we've never met, but I have worked with former Astros like Alex Cora at the Red Sox and Jeremy Barnes at the Mets. So we have some shared connections for what that's worth. I've also objectively studied your baseball work with the Cardinals and Astros. When I was with the Red Sox, I wanted to try to identify what teams were doing what well. Yep. You know, what was always consistent was how great your performance was overseeing the draft and, and player development in St. Louis. And then those same areas as a general manager with the Astros, from my perspective, that's primarily the, the reason that those teams had major league success as well was that talent pipeline. And you obviously were a part of three World Series champions, two with St. Louis and one with Houston, correct? Correct. Yeah. And I'm sure your fingerprints are all over the most recent Astros uh, championship. We'll talk about baseball. I do want to talk about that experience, but I am very interested in what you're doing now with Blue Crow Sports Group being an international football. So we'll get into that as well. What I primarily want to talk about are a few specific areas. One, your role as an innovator and disruptor in the game. And it seems like you're doing that again in mm -hmm. international football. I also want to compare and contrast that with your values as a leader, your philosophy on culture. And thirdly, I'm very curious about how a baseball guy can have success in a very different sport like football. Mm -hmm. We should talk about some of the high profile controversies that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the way your time in Houston ended was not probably the way you wanted it to end where my time with the, with the Mets ended in a way that obviously was not how I wanted it to end. So I won't be coming from a place of judgment uh, when we talk about those things, but I do think it's, it's something that relates to those topics. So let's get into it. You know, I had three careers uh, before I got into baseball. My, my first career was as an engineer. I was trained as an engineer. I worked as an engineer. 
for the company that makes Gore-Tex fabric. And it was a traditional engineering job, lots of math, lots of science, lots of experiments, that sort of thing. Um, I went to get to business school at Northwestern with the idea that I was going to transition into a business management role. And like so many people that go to the top MBA programs, you get recruited by a consulting firm, one of the top firms in the world. And it's a great place to spend a few years continuing your education, learning about business at the highest level. So I spent about six years with McKinsey and Company, working for Fortune 500 companies on lots of different topics. My area was more retail and um, marketing, uh, those types of clients. But I, I served clients in lots of different industries, including high tech. And then this was the time during the first dot-com bubble. I went out to California and was part I participated in two startups, technology startups, uh, basically trying to take advantage of the internet and technology and, and, and bring value to consumers. None of that would naturally lead to baseball. Right. But um, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, Michael Lewis, and I've talked to him about this. Um, you know, he wrote that book and published it in 2003 in June. And I, at the time, my my wife bought me a copy of the book for my birthday because I my birthday's in June and I read it cover to cover. And I thought, wow, this is super interesting that mathematics and analytics and sort of logical thinking actually may have a role in sports. I mean, I've always loved sports. I grew up in Mexico, but I was a huge follower of the NFL, the NBA, MLB and uh, football, which is the number one sport, soccer, football, which is the right. most important in Mexico. But I never thought there was a role for someone like me because I wasn't a professional athlete. I was a casual athlete and just a big fan. I did fantasy baseball for years and years, and I was really good at it. But I don't know if that was luck or because I'm good at math or what. And soon after the, the, the book was published, I received a call from uh, the son-in-law of one of the, of the owner of the Cardinals. And he said, Jeff, I, I know I worked with you at McKinsey. You're a smart guy. You love sports. My father-in-law wants to hire someone or as a consultant or a full-time employee to help the Cardinals figure out how to do Moneyball because the Cardinals um, aren't doing anything in this area. And Bill DeWitt Jr. thinks they should be doing something, but there's nobody internally that can do it. So I interview with Bill DeWitt Jr. We have a great series of interviews. He's at the time he's living in Cincinnati. I don't even go to St. Louis. I finally go to St. Louis. I meet Walt Jockety. I meet John Mosellock. And Bill DeWitt says, I want you to come work for me. I said, well, I can't work for you because really, if I'm going to do anything with the Cardinals, I have to do it for Walt and for Mo. So I need to work for Walt as part mm -hmm. of my baseball operations. So he says, okay, well, um, it's going to be rough go. <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> well, um, uh, let me give it a shot, right? So I, I quit my job. I was running a tech company in California and moved to St. Louis and started working in baseball operations. And I had no experience in baseball. Everything I was asking, everything I was doing, it was met with some skepticism. Who is this person that comes in from the business world uh, engineer and is now part of the baseball operations group? So it was a, a rough way to start. Everybody knew I had support from the top, um, but that's not enough to survive in, in the world of baseball. How did you navigate the two challenges really that, that are similar? One... Yeah getting hired by an owner. I've had that situation happen as a consultant. So I know it immediately, there's some walls that go up when it comes to that. So I'm curious how you navigated that. And then two, just the, the transition in general, given, like you said, your lack of experience, and then you're going into a place where maybe people aren't thrilled that you're coming in to do what you're, what you're there to do. Yeah. I think the, the reason it worked for me and it didn't work perfectly because there were a lot of people that were not happy that I was there was because I sort of checked my ego at the door. Mm -hmm. And even though I had a lot of experience in areas where nobody in the front office had experience, we be it analytics or management or whatever, um, I, I knew that wasn't important to them. So I didn't talk about that. Um, and secondly, I listened. I spent a lot of time listening. So it took me about six months to kind of break through with Walt. And I, understandably, Walt was handed a vice president in his department that he didn't want and didn't hire. So I right. understood that there was going to be some hesitancy there. But I basically went to Walt and said, what do you need help with? What can I do that's kind of a pain in the ass for you? <laughs> and he said, international. 
You know, we, we closed our academy in Venezuela. We closed our academy in Dominican. We're only two teams in baseball don't have academies. I don't know if that's the right strategy or not. Why don't you figure it out? And maybe part of that was, okay, well, I'll get Jeff out of the office to Dominican and Venezuela, and maybe he won't be ahead of me. But, right. you know, I took it seriously. And I spent the first year um, going to Latin America, studying what the A's were doing, what the Dodgers were doing, what all the, you know, the Red Sox, all the teams that had made big investments in Latin America, and analyzing which ones were successful and which ones weren't and why. And came back after basically a year with a set of recommendations. We should establish an academy in Venezuela. We should establish an academy in, in Dominican. We need to have scouts all over Latin America. If we're going to compete for this talent base, uh, we need to be serious about it. But there's ways to do it that um, can help us more than other ways, because not everybody that invests internationally gets a higher return. So that was the first project. And I think because it was a project that Walt wasn't really that interested in, but wanted to benefit from having international players. Mm -hmm. Um, it was it was acceptable to him. Anytime I was asked to opine on major league trades, I re I relied on um, third party analytics that were publicly available. Uh, developed a partnership with a guy named Mitchell Lickman, who developed mm -hmm. the UZR uh, metric, and he became a consultant for me, non paid consultant. But he um, he helped me think through how to analyze major league players and rosters and all that, and I used his information and Tango Tiger was another one. There was a bunch of good sabermetricians back then who were doing good work in the public domain. And I just brought that to the table as another piece of information to help Walt and Bill DeWitt and, and John uh, make decisions. It wasn't threatening. It wasn't saying this is what you should do in this way, you know, but there was, there was definitely some signings even back in 04, like Jeff Supan was a signing that, he, you know, he was a low variability kind of solid number three starter. And that's what he was. And he was right. not going to be a number one, but he wasn't going to be a number five. You could pretty much count on him for, you know, a certain number of, of wins on a good team. And he came in and, and, you know, the Cardinals made it to the world series that year. Uh, David Eckstein was another one, a player that was undersized and didn't look the part for a shortstop. But when you actually right. analyze the metrics, he had really good defensive metrics. And so, you know, helped make the recommendation, brought him in, brought in Mark Redzelanik, two players that were critical for the World Series victory in 2006. So I felt like I had been part of the group that had sure. put together the roster those years. And we had a lot of success. My first year was reaching this, the World Series. Second year was winning the World Series. Um, so I thought, wow, this is pretty easy. But really, <laughs> my focus was on the next generation, um, helping scouting modernize and and helping player development modernize and it started with scouting and i spent a lot of time in baseball stadiums in in colleges in high schools with the scouts asking them questions i wasn't giving my opinion i it, it took me probably five years before i gave my own opinion about a player i mean i i learned how to write scouting reports and all that but really i was interested in how they think and how they make decisions and then i watched the first draft in 2004 and I watched how decisions are made. And that's where I realized um, it all comes down to decision making. There's lots right. of information available, but how you prioritize the value of each piece of information, whether it's medical or psychological or skills or per performance history or size, all the things that go into making a decision, how do you prioritize those variables? And how do you compare across a thousand players available in the draft is almost an impossible task for any one human being. Right. So we started uh, to build a, a, a platform, a system that would, you know, try and analytically prioritize all the information from the scouts, from the analytics, from the video, from the doctors, everything else into some sort of grading system that we agreed to up front and then let the players go into it and see what pops out the other end, as opposed to, you know, the I noticed the first draft I watched, the scouts that were most passionate got more players because mm -hmm. they were really good at arguing for their players. <laughs> right, right. That's not, that's not a good way to decide which players uh, you should yeah. draft. So um, there were a lot of flaws with the system, um, and we started to address those. And then I, um, after I made the recommendation, the, the ownership group said, okay, well, we need you to run the draft because you can make these recommendations, but unless you're running the draft, no one's going to do them. Right. So that's when I hired SIG. And we started putting together this model and started running the draft. From that draft in 05 until I left the Cardinals in 11, 
I do believe the Cardinals drafted more wins above replacement than any other team in baseball. And, yes. and a large part of that credit was due to the sort of systematic decision-making process that we put in place that ended up getting guys like Matt Carpenter in the 13th round and Alan Craig and Daniel Descalzo, players that weren't sexy, they weren't scout yeah. dreams, but they ended up being good performers for the 2011 World Series, Lance Lynn, et cetera. Felt pretty good about that. The biggest challenge after sort of working on the draft for a few years was the fact that the player development system didn't accentuate the things that the draft was finding. So we were drafting for one thing and developing a different thing. I went to ownership group and I said, look, you know, we're going to continue to draft good players, but if they're not getting the playing time or the development that they need because they don't fit the profile of what player development typically wants, you're not going to get the return on this investment. So that's when they asked me to take over player development as well. So here I am, three years removed from making custom chinos using <laughs> algorithms in San Francisco for Land's End. And now I'm in charge of international player development and scouting for the most successful National League team in history. I've got all these scouts and coaches reporting to me that have been in the industry for 25 years and really have no uh, patience for somebody that comes from outside the industry. So that part was a challenge. But again, I think the reason I was able to succeed there is because I didn't come in and let everybody go and bring in a bunch of new people. Um, some, some did have to go. Some left on their own. Some I had to get rid of. But by and large, there were a lot of old-time scouts and coaches that I kept. And I kept them because they're valuable. Their information is really valuable. And they were willing to work with a new system and give other input and, w and willing to see what happens. And I think that was, that was critical part of it for sure. It didn't yeah, eliminate like resistance, but it, it certainly brought a lot of it down. Sure. It sounds like, you know, it sounded like you were starting from zero really on the mm -hmm. analytics side when you got mm -hmm. there, uh, which is interesting to think back on because of where the game has gone, uh, especially compared to other sports, just exponentially more people dedicated to that space in baseball than any other sport. In addition to kind of integrating and weighting performance maybe a little bit more than it had been in the past. Did you end up revamping scouting processes in terms of yeah. the, what the reports look like, the type of information you were asking people to collect? Yeah, I did. And um, I made some mistakes along the way I, and I had to correct them. I didn't really believe in the 20 to 80 scale. I didn't understand why it was a 20 to 80 scale. And I didn't understand why so many outcomes are clustered between 45 and 55. And it's just natural sort of lack of willingness to take a stand on a player. I think a scouting scouts tend to be pretty conservative, even mm -hmm. though they, they're passionate for the players they want. So I tried to redo the scale. That was a mistake because the reality is it doesn't matter what the scale it is. Yeah. It, if they're familiar with the scale, it's a scale that, you know, you can use, you can adjust sort of um, what a, what a 25 means and what a 75 means if you want. But, but that, that's a battle not where that's a hill not worth dying on, if you will. I also tried to figure out if there's real expertise in pitching versus hitting. And if there's expertise in being able to evaluate high school players versus college players. Mm -hmm. College players are so much more advanced. The statistics really help predict much more. The high school players, obviously, you're looking at tools. I assigned specific scouts to be high school scouts and college scouts and specific scouts to be pitcher, pitching experts and hitting experts. And to a certain extent, that worked. But what I realized is that the best scouts want to do it all. They want to do college, they want to do high school, they want to do pitchers and hitters, and the best scouts can do it all. And so really it was more about how do you evaluate your scouts? And mm -hmm. I think if you had to do a distribution of scouts, like it, it takes a certain amount of experience to even be a scout. So even the worst scouts are better than, than me. Mm -hmm. But within the distribution of scouts, there's like, I would say 10% that are truly elite. And those are worth their weight in gold. And they're the ones that will consistently deliver good players year over year. Not every year, but, but in general. Then there's sort of the middle part, the middle 80% or the middle 70%, which one year, one scout will have a good draft. And then the next year, he'll have a bad draft. It's a, a, a group that there's a lot of uh, similarities. And then you've got the bad scouts, which you also have to identify and get them out because they're not helping you. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you realize that this is the population, uh, what they're really motivated by, and they're motivated by contributing. Everybody wants to be a part of the future. There was a lot that we designed into the scouting process that 
allowed scouts to feel good about a draft, even if they didn't get any players. Because each scout thinks, oh, that's my player. And then they root right. for that player. And when the player makes it to the big leagues, they've got that player on their resume. But mm -hmm. the reality is all scouts are contributing to the draft. And so I wanted the scouts to feel like this is our draft and I took part in it regardless of whether I got any players or not. And that, that right. was a hard thing to do. But we ended up uh, having a shadow draft and doing a lot of things that made them feel like they're part of it. And everybody got to contribute. I mean, you listen to a scout talk about their player, and then we would have scouts say, okay, you know what? That guy actually sounds better than my guy. I think we should have <laughs> right. that guy. Right. And, and it was fun to watch that happen. Uh, but scouting is the, is the blood of any sport, and scouts are underpaid, overworked, and really undervalued relative to what they do. I mean, yeah. the guys found Albert Pools for the Cardinals – got fired by the Cardinals before I got there. He never received any rewards for landing a Hall of Famer for the, for the Cardinals. I get asked this question a lot by baseball people where they say, everyone's doing analytics now. Everyone has 20 plus people on average focused on analytics and technology. There's no way to get an edge anymore, especially when you're talking about the draft. My answer is your inputs are what's really important. And so when you're talking about a draft model, you still have to be really good at scouting, especially when you're talking high school players. As you you know go down from big leaguer all the way down to the, the youngest players in, in the Dominican, that balance tips, right? And it's more qualitative evaluations. And so being better at scouting than everyone else is still an advantage. And I think people kind of miss that. Like That's probably even a bigger advantage now because they all have the same tracking data and probably building the same types of models. And maybe those models differ a little bit, but probably not a lot. The separator is how good are you at scouting? Right. And that should never change. I agree with you there. It's also interesting you talked about with scouting and player development. It seemed mm -hmm. like they were siloed operations, which is something I hear a lot. Baseball teams, I think, have evolved quite a bit where they realized we got to break down those silo walls. But in sports in general, I see that a lot when I talk to potential clients that um, they feel like, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing and we're not on the same page. And especially if you want to become more data driven in your decisions, you got to make sure everyone knows what's going on. So it seems like that solution for you in St. Louis was to put you in charge of both of those areas. When you moved to Houston, now you're in the number one seat. You're yep. the head leader there. You know, how did you address that those issues? Well, first thing, I was fortunate. I was able to bring over a couple of key people from the Cardinals. And really, Mike Elias and Sig uh, were two important people, but also eventually landing Brent Strom and some of the others. The, you know, the com conversation I had with the Cardinals is, these are all folks that I brought into the Cardinals. And now that I'm gone, they're not going to be used or valued in the same way. That, mm -hmm. that I did because you have new leadership there. So let me take them. And it was a tough conversation, but eventually mm -hmm. I, I won that conversation. They let me take That's them. Good. So it's, it's nice to be able to come into a new environment. Obviously I had a lot more latitude because I was a general manager, but I had trusted people around me. Dan Radisson is another one from player development that I brought over from the Cardinals that knew my style mm -hmm. and kind of knew the philosophy and were able to help me educate the folks that are there. Because when you take over a club, you know, you're taking over all of the people, all of the coaches, all of the scouts. You know, the Astros had gone through a rough decline from the World Series in 05 till, you know, being the worst team in baseball in 2011 with the worst farm system. So they, they, everybody knew that there was going to be change coming. Uh, but there's always good people in the organization. And I didn't want to start making changes without giving people a chance to show what they can do. Cause I knew the team had been kind of for sale for a few years and people were scared and probably weren't yeah. really doing the best they could do. Um, and I'm glad I did because I remember one of the um, interns from, that I inherited and he was just at the end of his internship when I started was Pete Patilla. Right. And I thought, well, he's an intern. I'll just let him go. There's no reason to keep him because we're going to turn over a lot of people anyway. And David Godfrey, who was the assistant GM, came up to me and said, Jeff, you should keep Pete. There's something special about him. And I said, OK, well, I'm sure we can find a role for him. So we kept Pete, gave him a role, and that role grew into a bigger role and bigger role and bigger role. And now he's you know, a general manager. So mm -hmm. it was good. And that, that happened in, in all the areas, in player development and scouting, in the, in the front office, et cetera. Um, but 
the philosophy was basically the same. What had changed is by 2012, when I took over the Astros, the Cardinals were what Sig likes to call, we were eating at the buffet by ourselves because we were one of the only teams using analytics to study the draft and to take right. players. By the time 2012 rolls around, most teams are doing this now, or a lot of teams are doing it. So we're, we're now competing for the same players. Mm -hmm. A player that, like Alan Craig, I could get in the fifth round in 2006, he would be a second rounder in 2012 because other teams right. appreciate those talents. Uh, you know, Matt Carpenter would have been a third rounder instead of a 13th rounder. So we had to figure out what our differentiation was going to be. We're obviously going to continue to use technology and analytics to scout and, and to select players. But that's when we realized that with the advent of these technologies, the tracking technologies, the radar, et cetera, TrackMan, that the, the next frontier was going to be on development and how we could take a 16-year-old from Dominican or an 18-year-old high school kid from Texas or a 21-year-old college kid from LSU and accelerate their development and help them develop the things that they're going to need to be at the big league level and succeed at the big league level. How do we develop those skills and that experience most rapidly? And having the technology and information and focus on a game plan for player development was really the bread and butter of what produced the Astros players. The Astros, uh, yeah, when we picked first in the draft, we had, you know, good players that were ranked high by Baseball America. But by and large, if you look at the success of the Astros over the past 10 years, the players were not ranked high on Baseball America's prospect list. These Latin American pitchers, Christian Javier, Framber Valdez, et cetera, they were mm -hmm. never ranked That's on true. our prospect list. And all of a sudden they're pitching in the World Series and, and throwing no hitters, that's because they were, it, they were development successes. They weren't scouting successes in the traditional right. model. We put a lot of focus on development um, in, in the Astros uh, system. And development doesn't stop in the, in the minor leagues either. When Verlander came over in the trade, mm -hmm. we knew that we could help adjust a few things. And granted, you're taking a already Hall of Fame caliber pitcher and you're just making them 1% better. Mm -hmm. That 1% can be meaningful. And in the case of Garrett Cole, same Garrett thing. Cole, yeah. Pitcher who obviously was talented, had success in his career, but we were able to take him and really get him to the next level. And those mm -hmm. are the sorts of things that, you know, that's still player development. You know, a guy could be 34 years old uh, and already on his way to Hall of Fame, and there's still gains to be had if the player has the right attitude and you've got the right plan in place. I remember when you guys acquired Garrett Cole, because from my perspective, it was like, oh man, these guys, <laughs> we could identify what needs to change with him. You guys could actually make it happen. I didn't feel like the organization I was with, the Red Sox at the time, were in a position to do that. And I think that's another area where there was a competitive advantage. Being an early adopter, um, you know, the Rays are in that category as well. People that are doing this sort of thing and been doing it for a long time and have good processes to actually execute on it. Uh, that's a huge competitive advantage. You know, there's been players that we acquired uh, in Boston that we couldn't get them to their max ability. And then they went to an organization like the Rays or the Astros and we were just holding our breath thinking this is going to, they're going to get it and it's going to piss us off. <laughs> but it's a huge thing. And you know, I'm curious, doing that, overhauling your processes in player development, both at the major and minor league level, that's a huge undertaking. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about baseball. It, that makes it different than the other uh, sports in the U.S. At least some of the bigger soccer clubs have lots of academies and things like that. But just the scope of the minor leagues is what separates, it, especially when you compare it to something like the NBA or the NFL, or college is their minor yeah. leagues, right? So that's a big, big task. Yeah. Well, from my perspective, I always felt like you guys, you know, you said you didn't make radical changes to staff right away, but it seems like you did fairly quickly. My description to people at the Red Sox was that, that you seem to take a tear the bandaid off approach. Was that your mindset? The focus was on performance and, and mm -hmm. doing the, the job that we needed to do. So like I said, I gave everybody a certain period of time to either adapt to where we were going, be, a, be part of it, or self-select out. A lot of people self-selected out. Or if they weren't just weren't a good fit, to, to move on and bring in mm -hmm. somebody else. But the first way was really keeping the people that are there and trying to help them see this new, more modern approach. 
uh, with respect to development, one of the things we did is we realized our pitching coaches and our hitting coaches and even our managers in the minor leagues, they don't understand how to use the technology and mm -hmm. we're not going to train them overnight. So what we did is we assigned a, what we call a development coach to each level, double AA, A, triple A, high A, et cetera. And the development coach had to meet two criteria. They needed to be able to program an SQL mm -hmm. and they needed to be able to throw batting practice. And the reason why we had those two criteria is obviously if they can program an SQL, they, they know technology, they understand they've got some aptitude with technology. And if they can throw batting practice, they look like they can at least be uh, on the on the field with everybody else. Amazingly enough, we found a lot of candidates <laughs> for this role. <laughs> yeah, you know, people that were coaching at junior college or had a degree in engineering and played at you know college at MIT or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we hired them, and they came in, and they they all did well, and they they became pitching coaches, they became hitting coaches, they became managers. And a lot of them have really had success in their careers. And what I realized is after two or three years of doing that, I no longer needed to hire that role for each team because the hitting coaches now knew how to use the technology. The mm -hmm. pitching coaches all knew how to use TrackMan. And so we didn't need this sort of interpreter there to help the players understand the technology and to help the coaches explain the technology because it, it worked. And when we reached that point is when I realized that now the Astros have an elite group of instructors at the minor leagues. And by the way, many of these are now in the major the leagues place, as yeah. coaches and hitting coaches. And I knew that we had fundamentally transformed the culture. It didn't mean that none of the old guard was still around. There were some managers and some hitting coaches and pitching coaches that were with the Astros before I got there that stayed there and they're probably still there today. Uh, but there was a, a new culture and anybody that wasn't a part of it didn't stay, didn't stick around for very long, either willingly or because we, we let them go. I mentioned him earlier, but I hired Jeremy Barnes away from yeah. the Astros when I was with the Mets. He's now the co-hitting coach with the Mets, but mm -hmm. I hired him as kind of a co-farm director. One of the things that he talked about that I found really interesting in terms of how to communicate with the old this guard, like the current staff right. that was there then at the Mets, they hadn't been a lot of exposure to analytics and technology, even in 2021 communicating what the vision was and how we wanted to get there. How do we figure out like who's going to actually be on board, like you said, and how are we going to get the people that want to get there, get there? And he would sit down with some of the staff members and basically say, hey, there's this minefield that we have to cross. And it's not an option to not cross the minefield. <laughs> and so some people, you're going to step on some mines along the way, and yep. that's dangerous and scary, but you're also not going to survive if you don't take those steps first. So I thought that was a good way to say it. It was very blunt. And maybe, you know, some people might think that's harsh, but it's the reality. It's like, no, this is where we're going. I want you to come with us and I want you to be invested in what we're trying to do. If you're not, then, you know, we're not the right organization for you. I kind of assume that came from the Astros culture and how things had been communicated over there. And I thought that was, that was really effective. You are very much an agent of change in the industry, both when you were in St. Louis and then with Houston, you inherited a team that was not in a good spot. As you mentioned, you had some bad years to start, uh, very low payrolls, picked top of the draft, stockpiled a lot of good young talent there internationally as well. Good development programs from the outside. There was a negative stigma on the culture of the Astros. Why do you think that exists? I always feel like you were kind of painted as just like bottom line driven and not people driven. What would you say to that? If you're um, creating change, that's scary and disruptive. And I think that uh, it creates a negative reaction. Any true innovator probably has a lot of people hoping that they'll fail because Nobody wants things to change, especially if it's an environment that they're comfortable in. Mm -hmm. We had a um, reporter come from Boston, actually, Evan Drellick, come to oh, Houston. I know Evan, yeah. Evan showed up and he um, immediately wanted to uh, expose me and the Astros for being evil. And, and that really was his goal while he was down in Houston. I had offered John Singleton a contract before he got to the major leagues. I had offered right. Matt Dominguez a, a contract and Robbie Grossman a contract. We were trying to lock in young players. We knew they weren't stars, but 
maybe they were going to be okay. And we wanted some certainty if there was an upside scenario that we would have some cost control. And somehow Evan turned that into me treating these players like, you know, assets and trying to take advantage of them and all that. I mean, it was a, it was an arm's length negotiation. They had advice from their agent and their right. parents and, you know, they didn't take the deals and that's fine. They, you know, they, I offered yeah. Springer a deal at the time before he got to the big leagues, which was, it's laughable now that we know what Springer became. Right. But at that time, Springer was striking out a ton in the minor leagues and nobody knew if he was going to be a good player. We thought maybe. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like um, just the, the sort of tone around the media messaging that really was driven by Evan was um, that we're, we're evil. We're trying to take advantage of, of mm-hmm. people. We're not considering who these people are. You can talk to any player. Um, you know, that, that was at the Astros when, when we were there. Now there were some, there were some controversial times when Bo Porter was there and some things were happening and we got hacked by the Cardinals and mm. different things like that. Um, and you know, everybody has their own point of view about what happened there, but by and large, the culture of the Astros was we value innovation, we value young players and we let our coaches uh, and our personnel do their job. And ultimately, we believe that this investment in the future is going to pay off with rewards once we once it all starts to come together. And that's basically what it what it was. And Mm -hmm. if you if you look at the people that have left the Astros and gone on to run other clubs or are have big roles in other clubs, um, you know, that to me was the most satisfying part. In 2018, the Astros supplied over a fifth of all the talent for coaches and front office across the industry. And there's 30 teams. So our fair share would be low single digits. Right. But we provided almost a quarter of the talent between, you know, Mike Elias and, and Cora and every, you know, all the mm-hmm. pitching coaches and hitting coaches and everything. And there's a reason why they came and grabbed our talent is because we were having success and our talent was the reason why we were having success, not just the players, but the coaches and the front office personnel sure. and so forth. So, that cannot be an indication of a toxic culture right. when people are succeeding and they're getting opportunities to go out into the rest of the industry and, and do what they do best. But I think it's just one of those things that when people are having success, outsiders and even some insiders want to bring you down a couple of pegs and do whatever they can to uh, make themselves feel more important. You know, you brought up Evan, who yep. I was not going to bring up, but <laughs> since you did, um, you know, obviously he's, he's written probably a couple books about mm-hmm. the Astros. Most recently, you know, you've had some books written about the cheating scandal, um, with the Astros it, and a lot of people, again, tend to attribute that to some sort of cultural issue. When you look back on that, what, what if anything, would you do differently? Well, I hired the best people, what I thought was the best people, and I let them do their jobs. And that's still essentially my philosophy in in sports and in business in general, Hmm. because no one person, and it really gets to the theme of champions, right? Um, NBA may be a little bit different, but in baseball and in football, you can't rely on a LeBron James to win your championship. You have to have a deep team and everybody has to play their role. And it's oftentimes the guys at the end of the roster. I remember I grew up a Dodger fan. And when the Dodgers beat the A's in the World Series, it was guys like Mickey Hatcher that were the heroes and they were the last men on the bench. And that defines championship teams. Contributions happen from the unexpected players. I mean, obviously the, the good players have to do their part, but you know, to win a championship, it's got to be the, you know, Marwin Gonzalez hitting the home run in game, game two. I mean, those are, right. those are things that, that happen. And the same thing happens for an executive team and a leadership team running an organization. Um, we mm-hmm. had really good people up and down the organization, talented people. And my job was to find the people, convince them to come in, give them sort of the general you know, direction and let them, let them do their jobs. I was not the type of general manager because I didn't play. And and you you probably realize this. Yeah. You know, when I would go down, I wouldn't go down and hang out in the clubhouse. I would go right. down to the clubhouse to talk to my managers and to do the things I needed to do. But that wasn't my comfort zone. I was much mm-hmm. more comfortable in the office or up watching the game from the, the box. Um, obviously, as a general manager, you have to go in the clubhouse a lot for different things. But that wasn't where I hung out. And so I kind of let the culture develop organically. And I figured mm-hmm. the people that were 
down there as the leaders, the manager, the bench coach, the pitching coach, the, you know, the traveling secretary, whoever's down there. I always thought it was a self-policing type of right. environment. And the reality is it, it, it is self-policing to a certain extent, but things can go wrong down in that environment. And if you're not in tune with what's happening, um, it can come back and, and you can be ultimately held responsible, which is what happened. I never tried to escape responsibility. I was the general manager. Um, the things that the happened in the clubhouse in, in, uh, during the season in 2017, it didn't, didn't happen in the playoffs. And for a small part of the season in 2018, uh, we're, we're against the rules and you know, that shouldn't have happened. And I should have been closer to it and aware of it. And, um, you know, other people down there had a chance to potentially stop it and they didn't. And I, you know, I still don't fully know why, um, but. It wasn't because they thought I was designing or wanted this to happen. It mm -hmm. was because it was an organic thing that happened and um, nobody wanted to be that guy to say, Hey guys, stop it. This isn't, this isn't right. Um, and I think a lot of people regret that. I never considered um, sort of making sure everybody's abiding by the rules to be a big part of my job as GM. I just kind of figured that would take care of itself. Obviously I was wrong. And that's, right what ended my time at the Astros. At the Red Sox, we were punished multiple times for some variation of sign stealing. Those times, you know, kind of forced you to think and look internally about what could be different. I can relate to what you're saying about not being in your comfort zone, being in a clubhouse. Same thing. Like I'm going there when I need to. That's kind of, I viewed it as that's their sanctuary to some degree. And I want to give them as much space as possible, both as an, an executive and then later as a GM with the Mets. Um, but I wondered when we thought about it internally, one of the questions I was asking, and some of us were asking, did we create a culture where it was results at all costs? Right. And I wonder if you ever, you know, you had great results. You had great results in everything you guys were doing, scouting, player development, the major league team. Did you ever feel like or wonder if that was what was being created intentionally and unintentionally? Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. And we tried to gain an edge in every way possible. And I think everybody wanted to contribute to that success and feel mm -hmm. like they had a part in it. And ultimately, some people were left to their own to decide whether that crossed into the gray zone or even the black zone. And, you know, everybody made their own decisions. Um, right. But yeah, I think the culture at the Astros was we want to win. And in order to win, we have to be good at everything. And we right. have to gain an edge, not just, there's not just one thing we have to be good at, good at hitting, good at pitching. We have to be good at everything, how we plan for a game, how we prepare for a game, how, you know, f physical training, all that sort of stuff. And I think everybody wanted to feel like they were a part of the success. Yeah, I would say um, that's a fair observation slash criticism that it was kind of win at all costs. Now, you know, I never felt like I was in a position where I had to go into the gray zone and make decisions that would compromise my uh, ethics or, you know, my job or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, but, uh, but so, some people certainly did and they, and they made those decisions and they didn't consult me on them because I think I know what I would have said, but I was never consulted. So I can't really right. play Monday, Monday morning quarterback on those things. Sure. Do you miss baseball? Um, I love baseball. I spent 16 years, 16 full seasons in baseball and about 10 years before that doing fantasy baseball and obsessing about every at bat for minor leaguers and so forth. Um, and I don't, I, I don't really miss, I mean, I keep track of what's going on and I'm still close to a lot of the players and coaches and staff that, um, I worked with, but, um, but the answer is no. And it's because I am fully engaged and happy in the world of football. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't mean I won't someday have something to do with baseball. And I've had a, you know, a couple of people already asked me to do different things. Uh, but right now I'm focused on football and I want to do what I want to do in football. And it's satisfying in many ways. And to a certain extent, you know, people aren't going to believe when I say this, getting fired from the Astros was a blessing in disguise at the time. I didn't think it was, mm -hmm. but you know, I just signed a long-term contract. I would probably still be with the Astros. It's not that the challenge was gone because there was certainly a huge challenge ahead of keeping a 
good team good for as long as possible and then figuring out how to rebuild, retool and not go through the lean years that a lot of clubs have to go through. I was looking forward to that challenge and I had a plan for that challenge. And I will say the Astros have uh, deviated from what I would have Mm -hmm. been doing had I been there. Uh, But, you know, the success of the Astros is, is, you know, unquestioned. I remember when I got uh, close to being partner at McKinsey and Company, I left right before I made partner because people were telling me, once you make partner, it's impossible to leave because mm-hmm. they, they throw money at you and, and, and you kind of now part of the part of the in crowd and, and it's, it's hard to leave that point. Sure. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to leave before that happens because I want to go be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And to a certain extent, same thing in, in baseball. Now, maybe I would have gotten fired for different reasons down the road, but having to, in your mid fifties, kind of figure out what you're going to do next. I mean, it's the first time in my life I had ever been fired. It's the first time in my life I didn't have a job since freshman year in, in high school. I always, I mean, I was either in, in class or mm-hmm. had a job. I never had more than a week off. All right. So I was like, well, okay, well, <laughs> well, not often do you get a time, a chance to redefine who you are, or what you want to do at this point in your career. And so I kind of took advantage of it and, and I've been, I've been very much enjoying it. That's good. And I, and I do want to talk about uh, what you're doing in football. I can relate a lot to what you just said. I feel the same way, not how I wanted it to end in that fashion, but forcing me in my mid forties to have to think about what's next. And in my case, I had been thinking about starting a business for several years, just kind of in the back of my mind and listening to podcasts about doing that and things like that. It, push me to actually do it. And I'm glad that's the case. In some, some ways I miss the everyday part of it. I'm still working in baseball with, with clients, but it's very different. And, um, a lot of that is different in a good way. <laughs> uh, and it's enjoyable, but let's talk about what you're doing in football. So you have four clubs all over the globe. You have one in Mexico, Czech Republic, Spain, and Dubai, right? Correct. So tell me how, how this has all evolved. So um, I, I have to blame a little bit of this on Billy Bean, because even when I was with the Astros, he and I and Dan Kantrowitz, another one, were chatting about the world of football and how analytics really wasn't used in football. A lot of things that Dan, Billy and I had done in baseball as innovators and as uh, you know who we were. There was an opportunity, a huge opportunity in football. Mm -hmm. A lot of decisions in football are made emotionally. And that's the first sign that there's going to be some inefficiencies. And it happens because owners of football clubs get so much pressure from the fans. I mean, we think there's pressure in baseball. It's junior varsity compared to what's going on in the world of football. Mm -hmm. The closest thing I can think of in the United States is college football. Uh, you know, Alabama, Auburn, or Michigan, or those types of environments, that's the closest thing to European football Mm -hmm. um, or Brazilian or Argentinian football. It's beyond entertainment. It is a way of living. It's so indoctrinated in people's everyday lives that their entire week is affected by the outcome of last weekend. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just incredible. So when owners of clubs are uh, under pressure from the media and the local fans and and all the people around them to to make changes, they tend to make poor decisions. Being sort of non emotional, logical about how to make decisions in the world of football, there's huge opportunities there. So even before when I was with the Astros, I had started dabbling in looking at investing in different teams in Europe, mm-hmm. and um, almost did at, at one point. Um, and then when, when I left the Astros said, okay, well now I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of time on my hands. I'm going to really dive into this and figure out what I need to do. So I studied, I studied global football, every country, what's going on, different levels, U S Mexico, Europe, South America, et cetera. And decided that for, for the business model that I would want to, uh, be involved in it's creating value, not buying a big team and trying to make it better, but investing in smaller teams that have the right characteristics to grow and then helping mm-hmm. those teams grow. And so what does that mean? It means uh, either buying second division or third division teams in environments where they can eventually get promoted to the first division 
or buying, you know, first division teams in smaller markets, but with, you know, where the markets are going to grow in the future. Did a lot of sort of looking at clubs and ended up acquiring first a club in Mexico and then a club in Spain, and just most recently the club in Czech Republic and in Dubai. But the big difference between, Zach, between football and NFL or N MLB or NHL or NBA is that the players can be monetized in ways right. that can't be monetized in traditional U.S. sports. You know, I drafted Carlos Correa. If I had been able to sell Carlos Correa to the New York Yankees mm -hmm. before he got to the big leagues for market value, who knows, $100, $125 million, and we could have used that money to go buy other players and do other things at the Astros. But you can't do that. The only way to monetize Carlos Correa for the Astros is to have him play in the big leagues and help us win a world series, which he did. Right. And then ultimately to maybe trade him when I was with the Astros, I traded for Josh Hader and then I <laughs> traded Josh Hader. And now he's back as a free agent, but mm -hmm. that's really the only way to uh, turn control of a player into something that might help your team. Uh, but in football, it's very different because the player rights are separate from what the player earns and the agency. People think that when you own player rights, that you are an agent, you're not an agent. You own stock in the player. And if you sell that stock in the player, you're not taking a penny out of the player's pocket. In fact, if anything, you're adding lots of pennies to the player's pocket because if you transfer a player from your team to another team for a big transfer fee, that player's going to get paid a lot more and his agent's going to make more and he's going to make more and his family's going to make more. So essentially your success is their success. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm taking 10% of his revenue and putting it in my pocket. Player development becomes key. And as I spoke before, player development was our bread and butter in the Houston Astros and to a certain extent the Cardinals before that. But the difference between player development in the world of football and in the world of baseball, you can draft Alex Bregman at 21 and develop him until he's 24 and he can make the big leagues and he can still have a Hall of Fame career. In the world of football, if you're not in the first division by the time you're 19 years old, your chances of being an elite player are, are way, way lower. If you look at the last World Cup, a lot of the stars are players that were in 19 or 20 years old. And these are players mm -hmm. that are already reached first division and are captains of their national teams. So what that means, and you're familiar with this because in baseball, especially in the international scouting area, you start to scout younger and younger players every year. And, you know, we, you and I were going down Latin America, looking at 14 year olds mm -hmm. saying, how, why am I, why am I scouting 14 year olds? Because if you don't sign them, the Yankees are going to sign them and you know, right. you're going to lose them, right? That's what the world of football is like. You have to identify talent at the age of 14, 15, and then you have to accelerate their development so that by the time they're 19, they can go to a Premier League club. That's just the reality of it, which means that it's a 12 month, 365 day a year. It involves nutrition, psychology, tactical development, you know, all the different aspects, physical development. Um, and you're talking about teenagers that, you know, their friends are all out having fun and you're asking them to do something that's obviously going to make them a lot of money and you a lot of money in the future, but um, it's to sacrifice real life for being a, a, an elite professional athlete. And that's all very, very challenging. These players come from everywhere. In baseball, kind of have a limited universe, US, Canada, Puerto Rico, Dominican, Mexico, Venezuela, you know, sprinkling of Asia, et cetera. But you kind of know where the players come from. Right. In football, they come from anywhere. It could be Ivory Coast, could be Argentina, could be Mexico, Canada, Russia, China, anywhere. So mm -hmm. the world is like totally available in terms of talent. But you got to deal with languages and agents and culture and FIFA regulations and everything else. The opportunity is there. And we're three years into it now. I'm going to show you here real quick. But um, I won 20 rings in baseball, mm -hmm. including the five World Series and 15 minor league championships. And this is my first uh, accomplishment, major accomplishment in the world of football. It's a trophy for winning the Mexican second division, which we won in December. Um, and I brought Congrats. it here. The guys in Cancun are a little bit pissed at me, but I brought it here <laughs> because, um, you know, this is a symbol for our company. That's why we're doing this. We're here to win. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we'd like to make money. And yeah, we'd like to, you know, have all the other things associated with, with being good at sports. But at the end of the day, 
you know, I've, I've lifted one of these trophies in baseball. And even though this one is a small trophy compared to the World Series trophy, you tell that to those players that were lifting that up on December 2nd and, you know, crying and their families there. And, and it was the first championship in the history of the city of Cancun and the first franchise championship. It felt every bit as big and as important, as impactful as the World Series trophy did for the Houston Astros the first time in franchise history. So that's why I'm in sports. It's really the reason. I'm glad I've in both baseball and now in football, something that I've been able to bring to the table helps do things like this and, and really impact people's lives in that way. So you just talked about a lot of the differences between mm -hmm. baseball and football. Given that all those differences, you know, how did you feel switching yeah. over to those sports that you could make an impact? Well, the first thing is I had to use the same strategy I had when I got into the baseball with the Cardinals. Check your humility at the door. Mm. To be honest with you, I love working in Spain because nobody there gives a shit about baseball. They don't know anything <laughs> about it. They don't right. know who the Astros are. They don't care. Baseball right. is irrelevant there. Jose Mourinho is one of the greatest coaches in football history, and he was coaching Roma until recently. He's one of those guys that just uh, has got, had a lot of big jobs with big clubs. Mm. And I was talking to him because the owners of Roma asked me to come in and do some consulting. And I was telling him a few things about my baseball career. And he looked at me and he said, Jeff, I don't give a shit about baseball. So don't <laughs> tell me anything about baseball because it's not relevant to my life. I'm right. a football coach and my world is very different. That was a very humbling experience for me, mm -hmm. but at the same time, a good learning experience because I don't go into a locker room and say, oh, well, I've been in locker rooms with Pujols and Yadi Molina yeah, and, right. and Justin Verlander. They don't care. They don't know who those guys are. Mm -hmm. Daryl Morey was the GM of the uh, Rockets when I was GM of the Astros and mm -hmm. the GM of the, uh, of the Texans also. The three of us would get together occasionally and talk shop and compare notes. And it's amazing how many similarities there are in the issues that you deal with, mm -hmm. with coaches, with players, with medical, with, with media, with internal stakeholders, with fans, all of that, that are very, very similar. I'm president of basically four different football clubs in four different countries and three different continents. And there's very few situations that have popped up where I've, where I haven't said to myself, I don't say it out loud, but, oh, I've seen this before. Right. I saw this, you know, when Springer was coming up, or I saw this when Correa was coming up, or I mm -hmm. dealt with this issue with, you know, J Jared Cozart in our clubhouse. Because they're human beings playing professional sports. Right. And the issues they deal with and the egos and the, the conflict between teammates and, and between teams and everything, it, they're very, very similar, as is some of the ways you have to uh, make these players better. You know, the Astros had a way of um, making sure that every player from big leagues to Dominican Republic Academy knew what their three most important player development goals were. And, you know, we've instituted that now with my teams in football. You can grab any one of our players off the field and say, what are the three things you're working on? And they're going to tell you. So those things work. The things that work in baseball also work in football. And a lot of the issues that you see are, are familiar because they're, they're same topics that you've dealt with before. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen that in my yeah. early experience yeah. with other sports. Uh, pretty much every sports team is concerned about at the highest level, two things, getting the best players and getting the most out of those players. Yeah. And so since that's kind of the common thing across all sports, a lot of those issues end up being similar. The details are very different, you know, setting up a process in order to develop your players and what are your KPIs? What are the things you're focused on? They're different in the sports. And, you know, you obviously need people that know the sport to help kind of figure out what those things should be. But like you said, a lot of it is still similar in terms of creating some sort of structures for, for players to thrive and also understanding kind of the fires that are going to pop up or very similar <laughs> across the sports as well. So, but I always joke when I talk to football clubs, international football clubs that, um, I get the Ted Lasso treatment. Who's this, this American guy's that he's going to help my Italian soccer team <laughs> or football team. Number one rule, don't call it soccer, but that's been interesting. I, do you find that there's a cultural issue there or have you run into that at all? I mean, no, you're fluent in Spanish and you grew up in Mexico, so it's yeah. different. That helps the fact that, I mean, the, the, the people in Spain, um, think I'm Mexican and I do have a Mexican passport, 
Mm-hmm. But I'm more American than I am Mexican. Um, and people in Mexico and the U.S. would know that. But in Spain, they think I'm Mexican. So that sort of adds a little bit of more acceptance potentially. Right. Uh, you know, Mexico has a strong football culture. But the U.S., f- football in the U.S. is really growing. I just went to the CONCACAF Champions game last night uh, between the Dynamo and, and St. Louis City. There's still a lack of sort of complete engagement of the fans, and it's it's not reached the level of of the big sports in the U.S. But it's it's getting better. The quality of football is getting better. Obviously, Messi coming here has been a big impact. The fans, at the end of the day, they care about one thing and one thing only: Are you investing in their team to make mm-hmm. them better? Because they just want to win. They demand the best players, and and if something goes wrong, it's your fault, not theirs. And, you know, fans are the same. They have an insatiable appetite and they want results now. They don't want to wait for results. That's pretty similar. I did hire a PR agency before we got into Spain because I know a lot of foreign investors, American investors in particular, have made massive mistakes in PR going into Europe, trying to manage these clubs from afar. And the thing about a football club, it doesn't matter if it's Wrexham or Leganes or Real Madrid, it is a local asset and a local uh, thing that belongs to the fans. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand the fans and the local aspect of it, you're just going to get chewed up and spit out. When things are going well and your team's winning, it's fun to show your face around and kind of uh, collect accolades. But when things start going south, um, most, you know, American foreign owners kind of uh, avoid that having to be involved and avoid showing their face. And that's the worst thing you can do with these clubs. Last year, my team was in relegation zone and we had a potential to get relegated, which would have been a disastrous outcome for our first year of ownership. And the PR firm consulted me and said, this is when you need to actually be there. You need to be there at the games. You need to go around and talk to fans and you need to be present. You need to listen to their concerns. And, you know, there's nothing you can do to address them. But if, if you, if you're not there, if you don't want to have that uncomfortable experience, um, you're going to have a higher cost later. There was a game. My my son Henry, my wife, my uh, brother f- uh, from it came in from England. Um, it was a home game, and we had not scored a goal in 550 minutes, uh, which felt like an eternity. And there was a demonstration outside of my office, and there were you know just a couple hundred fans, but they were out there and they were screaming, you know, come down here, speak to us. So you know, I went out of the balcony. I tried to talk to them a little bit. Um, you know, we ended up losing that game three to one. We were up one nothing and they scored three goals in the last 10 minutes. It was one of the most horrific endings to the game that I had ever experienced. Mm. And it was the only time since I've been in Spain that I had to be escorted to my vehicle oh, wow. by police um, to avoid any conflicts. And nothing happened, but right. even but it's this precaution. Wow. But the fact that I was there and I didn't run from it, I ended up firing our manager. <laughs> Three days later, mm-hmm. I tried to make it through with him, but it was just the pressure was just too enormous. We ended up going on a nice run and saving our season. And now this season, we're in first place. So things are looking a lot That's different great. right now. But there's a lot about recognizing and, and having empathy with the fans and yet still being able to do the things that you need to do. Um, you know, there's there's moves we've made, whether it's bringing in players or coaches that are not sort of traditional, they're a little a- atypical. Um, and they've worked, most of them, not all, not all of them. Um, and I think now that you know, sort of halfway through year two and things are successful, um, at least so far, I, I'm starting to get a little more uh, leeway from the fans. They're starting mm. to trust us a little bit more. But there's a lot of skepticism to, to outsiders. And you think that local need to be there is different than w- what we see in other sports in the U.S.? Yeah. Why do you I think mean, that is? First of all, the culture, at least in Spain, I sit next to the president of the visiting club, or when I go on the road, I sit next to the president of the host club. We sit right next to each other during the game. <laughs> so when my team scores, I can't cheer. Right. When his team scores, or her team scores, they can't cheer. And we eat lunch together beforehand. If I'm not there to receive another owner, they're kind of like, well, why is, why is mm. he not? Right. So there's a little bit of there's that respect. disrespect yeah. part. Yeah. Um, but you know, also the fans want to see you there. The media wants to see you there. Last year, I moved my family to Madrid for six months. They're back here in Houston now because, you know, my son's, my, my family is here. Uh, but I moved them there for six months for just so I could be there a lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if uh, we get promoted this year, which is a possibility, 
you know, next year I'm going to be hosting Real Madrid in Barcelona, Sevilla, Valencia, uh, Betis, some mm-hmm. of the biggest clubs in the yeah. world. And I'm going to have to be there. So I've already right. warned my family, you know, sure. you guys come back with me to Madrid for six months or, <laughs> you know, you might not see me that much. So are so. they rooting against the team? No, <laughs> I'm, not I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, a huge outcome getting promoted. It's, it's one of the greatest. Oh yeah. Yeah. Getting it's promoted. A, that's what's unique about that sport is this huge financial swings and impacts on people's lives that that can have. Uh, the, you know, the local thing is fascinating to me because because that's my sense without, you know, having a lot of knowledge um, of international football, that that's my sense that there does seem to be this stronger connection to the fan base than what I've experienced in baseball and see with other sports in the U.S. And it's kind of sad that that doesn't really exist as much. I mean, in Boston, probably fairly as close as you could get to that in the relatively compact city with a lot of people and an intimate ballpark and things like that. So you feel a little bit of connection, but it's, I wish at the management level, the ownership level that that was a stronger consideration. Not that it should mean you go to the point of being more emotional and reactionary about your decision-making because that's what, where it could probably create a challenge yeah. just in general. I mean, when I, was with the Mets. I, you know, I observed all these different general managers, four different general managers of the Red Sox. When I finally was kind of thrust into that seat at the Mets, I had never done media. It's definitely not my comfort zone. I'm not starting a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But it's now I technically am media, but it's not, you know, that's not my wheelhouse. It's not my comfort zone, but I felt like I owe it to the fans to be as transparent as possible. I'm not going to give away huge secrets, but I always felt like a lot of people in baseball act like we work in the Pentagon. It's entertainment and it's for them and it doesn't exist without them. So I'm thinking back to myself as a kid, yeah. what got me excited about baseball was, you know, all the transactions and kind of hearing what goes on behind the scenes. And that's, you know, a big part of why I'm doing this podcast is to kind of pull the curtain back a little bit. It actually was a thought that was triggered by watching a documentary about a football club where I felt like I have to remind myself after, you know, 17 years at the time, 17 years in baseball, that this is really for them. And yeah. how can I at least incorporate that into how I carry myself on a daily basis? And I'd like to think I did that part of the job well. <laughs> Maybe there are other things I did wrong, but I'd like to think that <laughs> helped guide me to make it, some good decisions and how I handled that. Yeah, it sounds like you did. And, and to be honest, that's been my philosophy since day one when I entered sports is that we, and we as either management, a general manager, a, a, a scout, or an owner, we're stewards of this team that belongs to the fans. When we leave that team, if we can leave it better off than when we got there, I think we've done our jobs. Um, and I think that gets lost a lot in today's world where sports has become a business mm-hmm. and you talk about investing in a in a in a team in order to watch the equity appreciate and right. selling it or moving a team from Oakland to Vegas or whatever mm-hmm. lose fact of, the, uh, of this notion that the team is the fans the fans are the reason why the team exists and exactly. why this passion and this this you know revenue opportunity exists and um and we are stewards of this of this asset that belongs to the fans regardless of what the ownership cap table looks like and i've i try and keep that uh, as as our guiding principles for any, it, it doesn't matter if it's baseball, football, or anything else. That's great. Well, I think that's a good place to to end this conversation, uh, Jeff. I really appreciate your time. Sure, uh, it's a very enlightening and interesting conversation for me. So I, I really appreciate it. It's been nice chatting with you, and and who knows, I'm sure our paths will cross uh, in the future as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of Deconstructing Champions. I hope you enjoyed learning about Jeff's unique journey in sports. Being a disruptor and innovator can at times be lonely, as many insiders may be rooting for your failure. Sticking to his beliefs in the face of resistance has served Jeff well, and he continues to yield positive results even after switching to a completely different sport in a more intense culture. His approach may not be for everyone, but it's hard not to respect his relentless pursuit of winning. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the podcast, please share it with friends and colleagues. You can find me on all social media platforms at Zach Scott Sports. That's Zach with a CK. 
If you work for a pro sports team and want to be empowered to win through data-informed decisions and elite front office talent, check out FourRingSports.com. That's F-O-U-R RingsSports.com. Thanks once again to our guest, Jeff Lunau, for his time and willingness to discuss any topic. Please join me next time.